Um, where it says Lausanne, that's a typo for St. Louis. <laughs> and what says Monday, 13th July, that's a typo for Saturday, the 26th of September. This is my daughter. That thing on her head um, is called many things, but we call it in our family a smuffy. And when she got a bit older, she decided that I needed a smuffy. And a little bit later, she made me a second one as well, because now I work with process calculate. So there they are, in case you can't see them. Um, and the reason that I'm waving this around at you is to make the point that many people think of theory in computing as hard. It's this big, tough thing. No, theory is your soft, cuddly friend. I'm told what somebody once said, oh, well, when we called it monads, it was a mistake. We should have called them warm, fuzzy things. <laughs> so the, um, this is a talk about a way of building domain-specific languages. And I hope you'll take away um, from the talk a way that you could go about building domain-specific languages that you may find useful. Um, but the other takeaway from the talk is theory is your warm, fuzzy friend. Theory is not something that makes things difficult. Uh, I think it was Arbothnot who said, if you have a mathematical approach to something and you do not use it, it is as if you were trying to find something in the dark and you did not use a candle to light your way. So theory is a tool that will help things out for you, and it's warm and fuzzy and cuddly. So, the question I'm going to be looking at is how do you integrate a domain-specific language with a host language? And I'm going to um, base the solution on two old, uh, ideas. Uh, quotation, which goes back to Lisp in the 1960s, and normalization, which goes back even further to the work of Genson uh, in 1935. And this is, some of you will have heard me talk about Genson in my talk yesterday, and this is Genson on my chest here. That's the only t-shirt hackery I'm going to do, by the way. <laughs> Another lesson you can take away is this. What is a functional language? It's a domain-specific language for, for implementing other domain-specific languages. That's really what functional languages excel at. So I'm going to show you um, a particular approach to integrating SQL into a host language. And they'll say a bit at the end about how we also used it. So um, I'm going to integrate SQL into F sharp. And they'll say a bit at the end about how we also used it to take a uh, domain specific language for doing signal processing called Feldspar, developed at uh, Chalmers in Jotaborg in Sweden, and integrated that into Haskell. So I'll give you two examples, but mostly focus on the first example. And there's a paper you can go look, papers you can go look up. And of course, you can ask me questions. So let's get started. Who loves SQL? A few people. OK, I'm, I'm going to assume that we want to talk to SQL. People often do. And we want to make this integrated as seamlessly into our host language as we can. So here's a little bit of SQL. So we've got a tiny database of people. And we're finding um, all the people uh, who are older than Alex. So that's Bert, Cora, and Edna. Sorry, all the people who are younger than Alex. So we want to integrate this into our host language. So how do we do this? Well, we can take the database and view it as data. So in this case, um, we've just got one table called people. So we've got a record with one entry called people. And then we've got a bunch of rows in our database, so we turn that into a list, and each row has two columns, name and age, so each record has a name field and an age field. So we've just taken our database and turned it into data. And now we can write a little program against that data to execute the data. So this is actually very close in structure to the SQL that we had. So that says um, we're going to return uh, the name and age fields of V, 
and you and VH are both going to range over the people table, and when U name is Alex, that VH must be less than UH. So that's why we're finding all people younger than Alex. And this is exactly the same thing for U and DV people. For V and DB people, if U name is Alex and VH is less than UH, then return the name and age field. That gives the exact same answer. So there, done. Perfect. Anything wrong with this? Boy, what a quiet bunch. <laughs> so we're, we're all done, right? This is a perfect solution. Yes? It's a bit inefficient, right? Normally, we would expect this to run in um, about linear time if you do the indexing properly. But this is going to do two loops over the table. So it's going to take quadratic time rather than linear time. So it's just a lot less efficient than the actual SQL code. So that's a wee bit of a problem. Any other problems? Uh, okay, so the, this is more um, imperative than declarative. Actually, it's, it's so, so um, what to do rather than what you want was the way it was put. Actually, no, because the structure of this exactly matches the declarative structure. So I'm going to say that it's the same structure as the SQL. So I, um, I don't think that's too much of a problem. I think the efficiency is a problem. Yes? There's a disparity between the data and the query language. What, what do you mean by that? Uh, impedance mismatch. Right? The There's an impedance mismatch. Oh, so our goal here is to reduce this impedance mismatch, right? to be able to access the data completely. Okay, but there is another problem here that nobody's mentioned yet, but I'm sure many of you have already thought of. Right? This table has six lines. Okay? Reading this into memory and storing it as six lines, that's not a problem. Of course, often databases have terabytes of data. I'm doing this because there's a bright light there that's shining on the screen. Um, <laughs> right, sometimes instead of six lines, you have terabytes and terabytes of data. And reading all that in to the uh, main memory would not be feasible. So it takes way too much space, and it takes way too much time. Other than that, it's perfect. So what are we going to do about it? What we're going to do is um, write some stuff in blue. And what I've done by writing stuff in blue is you see the blue things, uh, the blue term is surrounded by these um, less than at sign and at sign greater sign. That's how you do quotation in F sharp. So this is no longer a term, it's a data structure. It's a data structure that represents the term. And the type of a data structure that represents um, a term is expert of the type of the term. So DB here is um, a people record, which then contains um, lists of, uh, name, of records with name and age fields. Um, and so the type of this thing, which returns a table like that, is an expert of records of those kinds of lists. Um, so we just write expert of some type to mean uh, a data structure in memory representing the parse tree of a term that returns a value of that type. And this is very standard. This is just called quotation. How many people are completely asleep because they're very familiar with quotation? Okay, only about half of you are admitting to being very familiar with quotation. Um, I suspect many more of you are familiar with it. But if you're not familiar with quotation, congratulations, you've just met quotation. It's an old technique going back at least as far as Lisp, and it's extremely useful. So it's a very standard technique. We can represent terms of our language as data in our language. And now the point is we've represented this as a term, so we can have a pros processor that deals with that. And it's called run. So run takes in this data structure, and then I already mentioned this looks a lot like the SQL, so it can convert it directly to the SQL. Now, in general, for every program we write, it might be a bit harder to convert to SQL, so that's the next thing we're going to talk about. But here it's very easy and straightforward to compute, convert it to SQL. So the steps that run takes 
is it's going to simplify the quoted expression. Uh, in this case, the only simplification that's needed is you notice, so these bits written in black with a percent in front of them are anti-quotation. And that just means, okay, there must be a term, an expert term of the appropriate type that goes in there. And DB is a term of type expert DB. And that database primitive, um, for a naive user, it means that's the whole database read in as data. But what we're actually going to do is just generate SQL that doesn't need to read in the whole database. Um, so we have a database primitive that gets spliced in in those two parts. So database and run are the two primitives that we've introduced here. Everything else, the for and if and yield, happen to already be parts of F sharp. So we simplify the quoted expression. We then translate that quoted expression, a query, to SQL. We execute the SQL, and then we translate the answer back to the host language. Remember I said, if you took the whole database and read it in, that would be too expensive. But the answers are usually much smaller, so we're going to assume that we can just um, translate those at once. If you wanted to, you could add um, streaming, but I won't talk about that. And then we get a theorem. Warm, fuzzy feelings. <laughs> that each run generates a query. If the answer type is flat, just meaning it's a table, just meaning it's a list of records of scalars, where a scalar is, is a basic type such as integer or string. So that's exactly what you can store in SQL. So it just says the answer is of a type that SQL can represent. If we're going to translate to SQL, that seems a reasonable constraint. We only do permitted operations. So for instance, most versions of SQL don't implement recursion, so we better not use recursion. And we only refer to one database. Remember, I spliced in DB twice here. It was the same database both times. If we ever refer to two different databases, then you'd have a query across two different databases, and that would be hard to change, uh, translate into a single SQL query. So those are reasonable constraints, and those are ones we impose. Um, you might actually want a type system that imposes all these. We want, and that's very easy to do, but we want it to run in standard F sharp. So we just assume that users can check these and we check it at runtime. And it's easy to check. Now I just showed you the technique applied in F sharp, but it's, all you need is some form of quotation. It turns out lots of languages supply this. So Scala is an example of a language that supplies this. So here's the same thing. There's the naive query in Scala. It's very similar. And here's the same thing using this technique in Scala of writing bits in blue. Um, the interesting thing in Scala is there are no quote marks or anti-quote marks here. The way Scala does it is with type inference. And this type that I was calling exp, because it's called exp in F sharp, is called rep in Scala. There's something called lightweight modular staging in Scala that gives you a library that does all this. And in fact, there's an interesting question. Is it better to have explicit quote marks or to let the type system do the inference? I think that's still open. OK, so that was a very simple query. Let me show you some more interesting queries. Um, so the most obvious thing to be able to do is to be able to abstract over values. So here's a little query that takes in two numbers, A and B, and it returns all peoples whose age is less than, um, greater than or equal to A and less than B. So if we run range over 30 and 40, this will give us all our 30-somethings, and this will just translate into this query very straightforwardly. So all you need to do is substitute 30 and 40 for A and B, um, and then that looks almost exactly like the SQL below. That's fairly straightforward. So fun, by the way, is the key word for introducing a function. So it's just as a function that takes two arguments, A and B, and then returns the value, uh, which in this case is a table of names uh, on the, uh, to the right of the arrow. And fun is, of course, the key word in F sharp that stands for lambda. So let's do something more interesting. Pretty much every system for integrating SQL into a programming language can do that. This one you find much more rarely. Satisfies, it's going to take a predicate that is a function from int to bool 
and return a table of names. So now we have a function that takes a function as an argument, what's called a higher order function. So now we take this function of x that returns true if x is bigger than 30 and less than 40. So this should it turn into the same query as before, and it does. And how does it do this? Well, we take one argument, p, which is bound to this function here, and then p gets applied to age. So when we apply p to age, then x gets replaced by w dot age in both places, and that turns into this query. So just by simplifying, by normalizing the query, uh, we can turn it into something that could be SQL. Does this always work, you ask? Yes, we have a theorem. I'll explain why that holds later. And then here's the really interesting thing to do. Pretty much every web service in the world is just something that has a front end. You type some stuff into it. It turns it into a data structure that represents a query. You then turn that into an actual SQL query, execute it against the database, and present the result. That's pretty much every web interface in the world. Um, so we, it's very interesting to be able to take data structures that represent queries and turn them into queries. And in this case, it's very easy to do. So here's a very simple thing. I'm going to have a data structure with um, three things, above and an integer, below and an integer, or and, and two more predicates. So this data structure is called predicate. So it's a little tree that represents a query, and it's easy to run over it. So um, apologies if you're not familiar with F sharp, but if you are, this will be straightforward. If you know most functional languages, it should be straightforward. Um, so we just look at the data structure T we've been given, and if it's an above of A, we turn that into the predicate that given X returns um, whether lift of A, whether X is greater than or equal to lift of A, or whether lift of A is less than or equal to X. And what's this lift thing? Well, remember A is going to be an integer, and what we need to splice in here is an expert of integer. So lift just turns an integer into the quoted term that represents that integer. And similarly with below, and then and um, just takes x and applies the translation of the predicate t and the predicate u to x and returns true if they're both true. So now we have something that given a data structure returns a predicate, and we can use our previous um, satisfies function to apply that. So we could do run of satisfies of P, and we get the same query as before. Notice, right, this is all straightforward and really easy. The only thing wrong with it is it's insanely inefficient, right? Because what does P of and of above of 30 and below 40 reduce to? Well, if you work it all through, you get that structure on the top, and then you have to normalize it a bit to get the structure on the bottom. So it's a fair bit of work to do this, but the normalizer does it. And notice we only do this once per query. Going out to SQL and getting the answer to a query is generally pretty expensive. So the fact that we need to do this extra work is literally down in the noise. I will show you some tables later that confirm that. Notice that to generate the query, we used recursion. Right? Of course, we just recursively walk over this predicate data type. It's a very natural and easy thing to do. But remember I told you, oh, you can't have recursion because that's not in SQL. But that's okay. That just means the blue bits can't use recursion. Here we have recursion in the black bits, so it's fine. So that's all there is to it. Okay? In 20 minutes, I have now shown you how to take a relatively hard problem, how to integrate SQL with your host language, and make it really easy. So let's just explore a little bit about why that worked and what's interesting about it. Now, if you're familiar with domain-specific languages, you'll have seen other ways of doing this, but they look slightly different from what I've shown you. So predicate for us had the type on the top, right? It takes, um, it returns an expert of int to bool. Many systems do it a bit differently. They take an expert of int to an expert of bool, and that's kind of useful because remember this insane normalization step I talked about 
where between you get this structure that nobody in their right mind would write down, and then you simplify it. So this just generates that directly. The language generates the structure you want without you needing to simplify it. That's clearly a good thing, right? But it turns out it has limits. It does work very well in this case. Um, so the way most people would write it is the way on the bottom. The way I've done it is the way on the top. And it's a trade-off, right? You could do it either way. Um, but most people always do it the way on the bottom. So the new thing I'm telling you here is, hey, you can do the thing on the top. And sometimes that will be simpler. And why do we want to do the thing on the top? Well, if you look at how satisfies changes, um, so on the top is the way we wrote satisfies. If you were using the other style, remember P now takes an expert of int to an expert of bool. So instead of having an expert of int to bool to names, what we would need is something that takes an expert of int to expert of bool and then returns an expert of names. And here's what you do. And notice this has something interesting in it. It has P that needs to be applied to W dot age, where W is bound in the surrounding quotation. And then this builds a structure where the W is properly bound, so that's OK. Um, there are complicated type systems that will guarantee that this is OK. So meta OCaml is a language that has a suitable type system for doing this. It turns out that F sharp is not. So if you type this bottom expression into F sharp, you get an error message, which translates roughly as, what are you, crazy? <laughs> You've got a W here that I don't know where it's bound. It turns out after you build the whole thing, it is properly bound. But it can't tell that using its simple type system. Um, so in our case, to use standard F sharp, we're forced to use the technique on the top. So this is why it's important to understand both techniques are available. Sometimes only the one on the top works. Now, it was so standard to use this technique on the bottom that I just assumed we're doing it the same way everybody else does. We're doing what the people on the bottom do. And then I thought, wait, 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 no, no, we're not. And here's me at the exact moment when I realized that. <laughs> this is actually a recreation. And in fact, my daughter, who sewed me the lambda, is the one who took the photo. Uh, that is Edinburgh Castle in the background. And this is really where I was at the moment that I had this insight. I was cycling through the links with Edinburgh Castle next to me um, when I suddenly realized, oh, what we're doing is not what everybody else is doing. Okay, I've explained the difference to you, and there's an easy way to summarize. Oh, let's see. I'll go back to that in a minute. There's an easy way to summarize the difference. We're using what are called closed quotations. That is, no free variables that get bound somewhere else. The other technique needs what are called open quotations. That is, you do have a free variable, in this case the w and w dot age, that gets bound somewhere else. And the other way to think about that is we use quotations of functions, whereas everybody else uses functions of quotations. So both techniques are useful. Um, and the point is to make you where you can choose among the techniques. And if you have a language that just has closed quotation, like F sharp, that's a good reason for choosing the first technique. Now, remember I said, um, so this other technique is sometimes called EDSLs, embedded DSLs. Um, and instead of an expert A to B, as we saw, you use an expert of A to expert of B. Similarly, instead of an expert of A times B, you'd use an expert of A times expert of B. And that all works out reasonably well, and the system will normalize things for you. But if you need a sum type, something that's either an A or a B, then you can't use that trick. Because here, an expert of A plus B, this choice between A and B is made in the quoted term. So that is, it's made in your target language. But here, this plus is now in black rather than in blue. So the choice between these has to be made in the host language. And we don't know at query generation time which of these two we've got. So this does not work so well. There are very fancy tricks that can make it work, but it does not work as easily. So that's another reason why you might prefer the quoted approach to the EDSL approach. And then the other thing I want to talk about is why this works. And it works, of course, because of theory. And you would have heard me talking, some of you will have heard me talking yesterday 
um, about the history of programming languages, and in particular the work that Genson did um, in developing logic, and in particular improving the subformula principle that says that if you have a proof, that the only things that you need um, to write down that proof are the hypotheses and the conclusion, and that in between all the formulas that will appear will be subformulas, that is parts of your hypothesis and your conclusion. So he expressed that by saying, perhaps we may express the essential properties of such a normal proof by saying, it is not roundabout. No concepts enter into the proof than those contained in its final result, and their use was therefore essential to the achievement of that result. So this was a nice property of logic. In particular, it let him show the consistency of the systems he was working with. But um, for us, it's really useful because remember, let's go back here. Right? This is involving functions, intubule functions. And this is actually a function that takes an intubule function as an argument. So we have a function of functions. SQL doesn't support that. Right? All SQL supports is tables, that is, lists of records of scalars, not functions. So how do we know it's okay to stick a function in the middle point here? The answer is exactly the subformula property. Because the subformula property says, look, if all of your hypotheses, in this case, that's the free variables, that is, and these are going to be bound to tables in the database. So if all your tables in the database do not involve functions, and they don't, right? They're just lists of records of scalars. And our result is a table, that's a list of records of scalars. So we're guaranteed to be able to simplify it down to get rid of all the functions. So we know that any functions that we use, as long as they don't appear as hypotheses, as free variables, or as the result, we will get rid of them. And the same would apply to products and um, to sums. And the normalization rules that we use are these here. So they fit in one slide. This is all online, guys. You can download this. Um, and the top rule is the main rule used by um, Genton. The, uh, it's called the beta rule of lambda calculus. And it just says what we did, right? If you've got a function from x to n and you apply to m, just substitute m for x everywhere. And similarly, if you've got a record, l equals m um, zero or more times, and you select out the lth component, well, that's just the lth component that you bound. So those are very standard rules. The others are very standard rules. Actually, the, um, the next two rules are what are called the monad laws. But sorry, I, I, I pronounced that wrongly. Let me say that again. The warm, fuzzy thing laws. Um, but having these laws is very helpful because this is what guides doing your normalization. And then thanks to Genson's old result, which we just adopt slightly, we're guaranteed that this process terminates and gives you a simplified term that if all your free variables are tables um, and the result is a table, doesn't contain any functions um, that you can't represent. So um, we've applied this in several different ways, right? To eliminate higher order functions. I showed you an example of that. You can also use it to eliminate nested intermediate data. I've not shown you that. You could also use it to fuse intermediate arrays. I'm not going to show you that at all. And we've used these in um, our implementations of SQL and Feldspar. But the point is this is a great guiding principle. And furthermore, right, I showed you two different techniques for doing things, QDSLs and EDSLs, and it works for both of them. So the subformula principle is a great guiding principle for designing DSLs, and it basically says you can use any feature you like in the host language, such as higher order functions or nesting, and as long as it doesn't appear in the free variables or the result, which in our case it doesn't because the free variables are all tables and the result is a table, um, then it will always simplify away. So it's a promise that you can get, use any feature you like of your host language and you will be able to simplify it away. 
Now, that doesn't always apply, right? One can come up with situations where it doesn't apply, but in a wide variety of situations, you can make that work. And you can use the subformula principle and this existing body of theory as a guide to doing things and as a guide to writing down your normalizer. So the basic interface that I showed you already existed in F sharp. This idea of saying um, we will treat queries as quotations um, already exists in F sharp and indeed exists throughout the .NET framework as something called link, language integrated query. And that's a basic idea there. Um, so there were already implementations of this idea in both the 2.0 and 3.0 versions of F sharp. And on the um, left here, I've written down the various uh, queries. So the um, first box are the ones we actually saw. And if I had um, an hour and a half to talk to you, I would also explain the queries at the bottom. But this one, for it, these two, for instance, are about doing nesting, um, using nested data. Uh, and these are about implementing um, X query in SQL using the same technique that I showed um, for the satisfies predicate with that PT0 and PT1. So the, here's the interesting thing. Um, notice that some things work in F sharp 2.0 and some things work in F sharp 3.0 and relatively few things work in both. So what this means is F sharp 2.0 and F sharp 3.0 used various ad hoc techniques to massage the quoted term they were given into SQL. And sometimes these techniques worked, and sometimes they didn't work. Um, and sometimes, in this case here, this was with a nested query, it worked, but it didn't give you just one query. It gave you a number of queries proportional to the amount of data you had. That's called a query avalanche, which is why there's an AV next to it. So it worked, but it was very inefficient. We have a theorem that says it always works. Um, but to make this work, of course, we have to normalize the term. So you remember I told you, look, you can normalize the term, and yes, it will take some time, but it's a tiny amount of time compared to the query. I said it's literally down in the noise. And here's the proof of that. The normalization time is in the column on the right, and just next to it is the actual runtime that we had, including the query. And you can see the normalization time is a relatively small part. Notice also, by the way, um, that we didn't write a very efficient normalizer. We could have written a normalizer that ran faster um, if we put more effort into it. So even with an inefficient simple normalizer, uh, the time is small compared to the query time. So there are two important takeaways from the table. Right? One is that this works. The normalization time doesn't matter. And the other is existing systems really do get this wrong. And using normalization as a guide is very important. So any of you, if you're doing a DSL for SQL or anything else, um, I would urge you to think, what are the relevant normalization rules? Can I apply Genson subformula property? That's a handy bit of theory that lets you structure your creation of a domain-specific language. And I mentioned feldspar, so this is the only time I'm going to show feldspar. And the only point here is that, um, uh, damn, this does not list the separate normalization times. But again, the point is that the times that we got are very comparable to the times for the old EDSL version of feldspar. So in other words, we can apply the technique, and it works reasonably well. Pablo Picasso is famous for saying, good artists copy, great artists steal. Actually, he didn't say it, apparently. Steve Jobs said that Pablo Picasso said it. So this EDSL technique that I talked about is great because it lets you steal the type system of the host language for your target DSL, and it lets you steal some of the syntax uh, of your host language for the DSL. Some things like conditionals get a bit difficult. QDSLs let you steal the types again, let you steal all the syntax, and then if you just implement one normalizer, you can use that across all your different DSLs for the same language, because you're just normalizing your host language. 
as long as your host language is the same, you can use the same normalizer. The weakness of this, by the way, is implementing the normalizer the first time is a fair bit of work. So what we'd hope is to provide libraries for people, and we're looking at doing that for Haskell now. Okay. Everything old is new again. How do you go about integrating a domain-specific language with a host language? Just use the old ideas of quotation and normalization. And here's the reference slide. I didn't do this work all on my own. Here are other people who have contributed to the work. There are the relevant papers. Um, for those of you who saw my, paper, uh, my talk on propositions as types yesterday, I did forget to mention that um, uh, propositions as types is written out as a paper. You can just download it from my website. Uh, and it will appear in CACM in December of this year. And um, also, the library that I showed you for F Sharp is publicly available on the website there and is part of the F Sharp ecosystem now. Warm, fuzzy feelings to all of you. Thank you very much. Okay, there's time for a few questions. Yes? If you want to go retro on your uh, citation, instead of citing McCarthy uh, 1960 for quotation, you should cite uh, Gödel 1931. <laughs> <laughs> so it's pointing out if I want to uh, go retro for citations instead of citing uh, McCarthy, I could cite Gödel. And of course, quotation's a much older idea as well. Quine, for instance, wrote a lot about quotation. Yes? Sorry, are there other? Uh, normalization uh, techniques for other features, like limiting, sorting, SQL. Oh, very good question. Right. What about the other features in SQL, like sorting or group by and so on? Are there good normalization rules for those? That's actually um, open research work, so we're looking at that question. Uh, there's a fellow named Torsten Grust, who's done a lot of work in this area. So if you look up Torsten Grust, you will see his solutions to normalization rules for those features. Yes? So you talked about how the embedded language SQL doesn't support recursion or higher order functions. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you just directly address whether or not that was a complete restriction or just something that you couldn't do because we were using SQL. If the embedded language does support those features, is that something that you could see in the quotation and actually normalize correctly? Right. So the question is, OK, in the case of SQL, it does not support higher order functions. By the way, for Feldspar, our target language was C. And we were doing very simple C, where, again, we did not want to support higher order functions. But you might have a target language that does support higher order functions. Is, is the technique still valid then? Yes, it is. Um, and in that case, you might have a result that still has higher order functions in it. So your normalization would not get rid of all of them. Um, another question that you might ask, which is related, is, well, wait a minute. This is always getting rid of all your higher order functions where it can. Maybe you don't want to do that all the time. And indeed, you might want some control over where you normalize and where you don't normalize. And in the papers, we talk a little bit about how you might give such control. Yes? Okay, so the question is, well, F Sharp is an eager language, a strict language, and Haskell is a lazy language. Does that make any difference? Um, in fact, the rules that I showed you that we used for F Sharp were um, uh, the lazy rules, the call by name rules, which lose sharing. So if you look at um, this paper here, everything old is new again, we talk about how you do reduction rules that do not lose sharing. Um, and as you pointed out implicitly, the fact that we could use this technique both for F Sharp and for Haskell shows that it works for both lazy and strict languages. Good question. Thank you. Yes? Would it be feasible to partially evaluate the normalization and compile time? Would it be possible to partially evaluate the normalization at compile time? In fact, what I've called normalization, other people would call partial evaluation. So it is essentially a partial evaluation technique. Yes? 
Yes. So the question is, is there a relationship between normalization and the Y Combinator? And we can take this offline if you want, but my first answer would be no. Yes, in the back. What happens if you, good question, what happens if you use a function in the host language that's not supported in the target language? So indeed, that's a weakness of this technique, which is we do not compile, we do not detect this at type checking time. Some other systems like EDSLs do check this, find this out at type checking time. Um, uh, Cheyenne Naj, who's the fellow in the middle there, looking a bit like a criminal, um, <laughs> is working on a tool now that will use template Haskell to do all the checking for you at um, type checking time. But at runtime, if there's an unpermitted constant, we find that out and we report an error at runtime. So we do report an error at runtime, but we don't, uh, that, where runtime means target code generation time. But we don't um, report it when you compile the host language. You would just have to look for such things. And our claim is it's not too hard to spot them. I see several other great questions, but we're past 10.50, which is why I should stop. So if anybody else has a question, please come up and talk to me. Thank you very much.